Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Franny Lindsay, a wonderful poet who never intended to be a writer. She trained as a classical pianist. But when poetry started calling, she answered the call, putting music aside twice. Franny's poems are inviting and authentic, filled with subtle rhythms and vibrant images. She often writes about people and animals who have suffered great traumas, but her work isn't dark. It's compassionate and humane. As an animal lover, I admire her dog poems and the fact that she has rescued several greyhounds. As a poet, I admire her wisdom and precision. So do many other readers. Franny's poems have appeared in many publications, including the Atlantic Monthly, Field, Poetry International, the Harvard Review, and Shenandoah. It is also forthcoming in Best American Poetry 2014 and has been featured in Ted Kuzer's column, American Life in Poetry, and on Writer's Almanac and Poetry Daily. In 2008, she won the Missouri Prize. Her fourth volume of poetry, Our Vanishing, has been awarded the 2012 Benjamin Saltman Award by Red Hand Press. I'm delighted to have her here. Thank you. Franny, it's hello. It's wonderful to be here. Hello. You have a Mabel poem I that do. you were going to share. I do. I do. Um, Mabel was a dog a greyhound whom I loved very much and she had many quirks mm. um, and she lived to be the wonderful old age of 13 and these were a few of her quirks and the ways in which we sort of shared some stuff in common. Mabel, won't it be good when Mabel can finally stop hoisting her hips down the stairs, taking forever to squat by the rhododendron. How calm the chipped water dish minus her tongue and the mother skunk leading her glamorous darlings unbarked at across the alley. Dog for whom the coarsest weeds will always part, here's your old leash where to? Grand Rapids, Tuscany, Reykjavik. She stalls in the middle of River Street, locking her wobbly knees. She's got to be to watch. So I bend and whisper as far as a voice can go into the dark of her ear. I give her behind a push. Then we mosey around the block, two aging ladies out to remind each other how pretty they were. Mm. I love the tenderness in that poem and the fact that you were just sort of helping her along, yeah. which yeah. is actually what you did when you first met her. That's right. And I love that story because yeah. the way that you had to coax her. That's right after your first meeting is <laughs> is very much like coaxing a poem. So yeah. tell us a story well, and then we'll talk yeah. about how the um, two relate. When I went to pick Mabel up at the kennel, um, the, basically the person who runs the kennel said, I don't think this dog is going to be able to go home with anyone. And I looked at her and I just fell in love with her and I said, can we try? Mm. And we took the whole afternoon. I turned my back to her for the first half hour and threw a treat to her from behind, from about 10 feet. And when she was brave enough, she came and got that. And then I threw it behind me a little bit closer to me and then a little closer. And when she was brave enough to come get that treat from two feet away, I turned sideways and started the whole thing all over again. And when she got to the two feet that way, I crouched down and threw the treat. 
And finally, after about an hour, I could throw a retreat facing her. And the real victory was when I could drop the treat in front of me with her facing me. And she still wouldn't touch me, but she could come get the treat. Mm. That's where we started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you think about the process of writing a poem mm -hmm. or receiving a yeah. poem, yeah. and then you think about Mabel. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> what comes to mind? Well, all right. Um, one of the things that poems teach you is that really you kind of have to leave them alone. You have to ignore them. You can't say, today, now, I'm going to write. You have to be busy doing, I have to be busy doing something else, ignoring the fact that I want to write. I have to forget about it. And very similarly, I kind of had to sort of let Mabel be herself. Just let her be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because poetry does sometimes tend to have a life of its own, yeah. or a mind of its own. And yeah. you do have to coax it at times and let it be at times. Yeah. But there are also moments when poetry comes to you. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I love about your life story mm -hmm. is that poetry did start calling to you. And yeah. when we were yeah. communicating by email, you said that you were an applied music student that's right. at University of Colorado Boulder. Yep. The trouble with my scholastic and musical performance was increasingly that poetry was subsuming my studies and practicing. It all fell apart, in other words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had gone back into musical studies. I'd been in conservatory uh, at the very start and then moved away from it and then came back and was very serious about it um, at UC Boulder. But Around the spring term of my second year, I started drifting away and writing poems. And I started sneaking my electives in, and pretty soon my advisor was saying, well, you know, you don't have any more electives you can take. You need theory, you need harmony, you need, you need music history, and that was sort of the warning bell for me to sort of realize that I wasn't in the right place. Mm. And that summer I applied to the Breadloaf Conference and got in and just threw myself headlong into writing and pretty much never looked back. Yeah. When you started to feel that poetry was becoming a bigger and bigger part mm -hmm. of your life. Could you pinpoint why? Did you have any idea? Was there a certain moment? Or was it just that it was right for you to start following that path? It was just, I mean, when I went to that writer's conference, when I went to Breadloaf, I felt like, oh, I've been trying to swim, but there hasn't been any water. Mm. And now I'm in the water. Mm -hmm. And I was surrounded by poets. People were doing what I knew how to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do it that well, but you know, you were around swimmers and you could watch people swim and say, oh, that's mm -hmm. how it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You kick your legs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I love about your work and your process is the way you start a poem. Because mm -hmm. often when I ask someone, how does a poem begin for you? The mm -hmm. answer is always with a phrase or with a sound. Mm -hmm. But you didn't say that at right, all. Right, right. I see things and mm -hmm. I, I see things and they translate 
into verbal images, but I think a writer has to do first things with his or her senses. I think you have to be a receiver. I think you have to see. I think you have to hear. Mostly mm -hmm. those two things, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, I might be walking to work, and this right away I'm thinking of, I, I was walking to work one day last summer, and it was after a very tragic thing happened to a dear friend of mine. and. This is a woman who's got a lot of courage mm. um, and who seems so outwardly fragile. And I looked at this flower and it was this big, garish, obnoxious looking, beautiful flower. And I thought, that's my friend. That's who that is. And every day I would pass that flower and I would say hi. Mm. There you are. Mm -hmm. There it is, and and it came that became that wonderful image, and so I was able to write off that, mm -hmm. you know, not about a flower, mm -hmm. but about a friendship. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like what you said about your friend looking fragile and mm -hmm. yet being so courageous, because yeah. in many ways poetry is like that. It yeah. looks like something very delicate yeah. that you might not want to touch almost. Yeah. But yeah. there is grit, there yeah. is courage, there is dignity. Mm -hmm. And the more you write, the more you come in contact with those parts of yourself. Well, I think the more a poet is going to go out on a limb and mm -hmm. be vulnerable, the more grit is involved. You just need to find a place within you that is just rock solid and doesn't give a hoot. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't lead with your own vulnerability. You just can't. Mm -hmm. Was it difficult for you to find that place? Um yes and no. I think I started finding it in graduate school. Mm -hmm. When I came to Iowa I my one of my advisors said just about the cruelest and most wonderful thing anyone has ever said to me in, in terms of criticism. He said, you write pretty. Mm. And when he said that, I thought, what a nice thing to say. <laughs> a little bit later, I thought, yeah, no. no. That was a real insult. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, it was a turning point. I mean, I looked at this sort of luscious, you know, wedding cake frosting poetry I was writing, and I was thinking, wow, you've really got to cut this just, you've got to pare this way down. Mm -hmm. And I did, I think for a while, I got maybe a little bit too gritty too angry, and when I started putting a little bit of the delicacy back in, mm. I found that I was very comfortable with it. Mm. And I could, the it could take a lot more because there was a lot more holding it up. Mm. At least that's what I hope. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You have said that your work has become simpler mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. What does simplicity allow you to do? It allows me to say difficult things. Hmm. It allows me to say, it allows me to break a heart. And I think it allows me to break a heart because behind the breaking of that heart, I hope my voice is saying, it's okay. It's okay. Now, go ahead and break. Mm. I, think, I think that's my job as a writer. Mm. Yeah. No one has ever quite put it that way, but I love that idea, mm -hmm. that it's okay to break. Yeah. Go ahead yeah. and break. Yeah. 
You have a lot of wonderful observations about poetry. And there's one that I particularly like. Mm -hmm. You said that a writer's soft spot is dangerous ground. Yeah. You have to, sus to suspect drafts of winding up terribly cliche and be merciless with them. You have to realize that the thing you love most is much, much bigger than you are. As a writer, you are not Goliath, you are David. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's talk about um, dog poems. Obviously, I write a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot, <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> have written dog poems. And a lot of people, when someone says, now I'm going to read you a dog poem, they just go, and rightly so, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's kind of like, and now I'm gonna read you a love poem, and it's about the ocean and the moon and how you broke my heart. Mm -hmm. and, and so you sort of hold your breath when someone gets up and talks about or reads about the thing they love the most. Um, and what I mean by David and Goliath is that as a poet, you are much smaller than what you want to tackle, than that thing that is very, very close to your heart. You are tiny. And so what your job is to do is to observe and describe the little tiny things, the buttons on the coat of the person you loved who is now about to walk away. Mm -hmm the way that the dog you loved wagged his tail or spit his food out when he didn't mean to. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. um, you have to just sort of go at it sideways from a different angle and from a much smaller angle. Mm -hmm. The details are what really breaks the heart in a mm. way that instructs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, especially young writers, have a hard time with that lesson mm -hmm. at first because yeah. it seems almost um, an oxymoron or a yeah. contradiction yeah. to think that if you want to write about things that can break your heart, which are often big things, mm -hmm. you have to go small. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you can't write a poem about heartbreak and use the line, my heart is broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. You had another great line where you said that I'm not writing for the reader mm -hmm. as much as I am for myself. The self who isn't particularly intellectual and doesn't understand a thing about poetry. If she gets it, I think I've done something right. Right. I'm not an intellectual. I'm not. I mean, there's, there's a big part of me that um, <laughs> chews gum and, <laughs> and hangs out at the mall. And if I can talk to her, she who is walking by in her leggings and little, you know, high-heeled sandals, if I can talk to her and she can look at me and say, wow, I think I just got something of what you said. That's my audience. That's who I want to talk to. I don't, I'm not so interested in talking to the people who know Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I want the people who say, I don't understand poetry to be able to say, I understand this one. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. And that young woman that you just described, mm -hmm. she is often the kind of person who might think that, oh, I don't like poetry, I don't, like I don't poetry. get it, yeah. this has nothing yeah. to do yeah. with me. Yeah. So why do you want to reach someone like that? Someone like that? Because what is the use of an art if it only benefits the community of artists who are mm -hmm. practicing? that mm -hmm. art. What's the use? Mm -hmm. We can all do that. Mm. Yeah. Very true. Mm. 
some of the recurring themes mm -hmm. in your work mm -hmm. are forgiveness, separation, mm -hmm. and secrecy. Yeah. Talk a little bit about those things. Well, um, I think forgiveness has come in via writing my first three books, and less so this one, um, on themes of trauma. I think the first one had a fair amount of anger in it. Mm -hmm. The second one, maybe about the same amount of anger. The third one, less so. And this one, almost none. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really, I was surprised by that. And I was very glad to see that. I really felt like that was a nice departure and a mm -hmm. welcome departure. Um, the separation, I think, when I'm writing, the perspective I take is one of aloneness. Mm. I'm very much alone with what I'm writing about, how I'm seeing it, and how I'm portraying it. It's intimate, it's immediate, it's close up. It's back to the buttons on the coat. Mm -hmm. It's it's right it's right at the buttons on the coat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting that you say there is a lot of aloneness mm -hmm. in your work because mm -hmm. I don't see that at all. You don't? No. I see connection. Oh, good. You're connecting to other people who might be overlooked mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm like the old man who comes to your door, uh -huh. or the greyhound mm -hmm. that would possibly be put down because nobody mm -hmm. else would take the time yeah. and effort yeah. to connect with her. Yeah. Your work is all about connection and mm -hmm. about the world oh, of you. the heart. Thank you. So I have to ask, because I'm sure that many viewers are wondering, why greyhounds? How did that... Why greyhounds? How did that start? <laughs> why would anybody want anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Say a little bit more. Well, um, why greyhounds? Back in 1990, late 92, um, there was a five-part article in the Boston Globe about the plight of racing greyhounds and about their adoption. And I had never known any of this, but I read that article, every installment of it, just with rapt attention and um, terrible sadness and wanting to do something. And about a month later, I decided I needed a dog. Mm. And so along came my first dog, my first greyhound, and I have since had seven. Mm. And they're the most wonderful dogs in the world. Sounds like a poem on four legs. Yeah, kind of is. Yeah. We started by talking about music, mm -hmm. and I want you to tell me just briefly about the music you hear every night mm -hmm. and how that affects your poetry. Okay. Well, I'm a pianist, as you started out by saying. I've got um, a grand piano in my living room. And right now I'm writing more than I'm playing. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes mm -hmm. I balance both of them. But I've got a number of pieces that I have just come to love over the course of my life. And I go to those pieces both when I'm playing and when I'm writing. You have another poem for us. Mm -hmm. I do. I do. I thought I would end, I, this is a sort of a bookend to the one we started with. Um, this is about Mabel's departure. Um, she died, as I said, uh, when she was 13. Yeah. So she's been gone about a year. Um, and there's an epigraph to this, and it's from Ode to a Grecian Urn. And here it is. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Portrait of Mabel departing. 
one clump at a time, the dog fur abandons the dog. Next go the toenails, tail tip, abundantly tickled, insides of ears, the lacy detritus of her slipping free with the nonchalance of a garter snake. Next go her sepia teeth and the five dry kibbles that crust her dish. Next, the trash bag that carries them out and the wheeze of the Tuesday truck and the handsome foul-mouthed boys clamoring off the back. Next, the corduroy bed stored in the basement beside the ice skates, the puddings away the slow forgettings, the knuckle bone scarred with chew marks, a keepsake now. Next, the siren with no howling to echo it. Next, the grass, her urine scalded, greened over, the cataracts dimming the days in August, and the nights that bring enough crickets to breathe Next, the grit her paws tracked in from the street. Finally, the carpet grayed with it. Finally, the house and the key and the dweller. Finally, the street itself. Thank you. That Thank was you. lovely. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm.